years. So this is, unfortunately, our last class. And uh, we do intend to devote it entirely to discussion. Uh, before I open it up for discussion, just one practical announcement. The law school has a procedure uh, for course evaluation uh, different from the rest of the university. So would law students please remain after class and uh, one of your classmates will hand out the evaluation forms. Uh, now, as well before beginning, uh, let, me <coughs> let me encourage you uh, not just to ask questions directed to us, uh, but to make statements, comments, proposals, uh, sparked by the experience of our arguments in the course, and to respond to one another uh, in the course of this last meeting of ours. So first I'm going to recognize one of the section leaders who is going to present some questions formulated by his section. Yes. So these questions come from my uh, two sections. Um, should I just say, mention the both of them? Uh, the, well, first one is, the American system of democracy is predicated on the idea that citizens will vote for their individual interests and that the estimation of their vote will be representative of the vox populist collective interests. But the truth seems to be that people don't vote rationally. Studies have shown their vote are changed based on the presence of threats. Voters' emotion-based decision-making, in turn, seem to desensitize, uh, seems to make governments, uh, keeping away governments from implementing more rational uh, policies. Given these facts, how are we to re-examine your claim that, quote, the solution to democracy's problems is more democracy? Maybe another way to put uh, what's behind this question, or, or something that is uh, behind this question, is how can one square the argument from this course with a more skeptical view of the ordinary men and women? So that's the first question. Uh, the second question is, we've talked a lot about the need to speed up politics and remove barriers to radical transformation. With the checks and balances provided by the current system, though, how can we be sure that this fast-paced political system won't allow for radical regression. If conservative and backward-thinking politicians gain power in a fast-paced political system, would there be any way to prevent them from undoing much of the progressive work of the past decades? Can one be sure that the loser will outweigh the winners, or the losers will outweigh the winners? In particular, in a political culture distrustful of social security nets. And maybe put more simply, um, it seems that the argument from the course requires one to accept a higher risk or, or a higher vulnerability, which might harm, at least in the short term, already vulnerable groups. How can a progressive accept that? Okay. I know. Why don't you begin? Well, first I want to salute you for the two questions, though, because they, they get at the very heart of so much of what we've been talking about for 12 weeks. When we talk about democracy, you don't just shoot straight to elections. You're talking about institutional background conditions. It requires a robust public conversation with a vital public sphere in which people have access to a variety of different alternatives. See, if we just jump right into the choice between neoliberalism and conservatism, neoliberalism and neoconservatism, no sense of why, in fact, those two alternatives are the only ones, no sense of the role of big money in shaping both parties who, who present such options, and no sense of the role of education that would help unsettle citizens to such a degree that they wouldn't be skeptical, they'd be critical. You remember one of the distinctive features of this class is to be skeptical about skepticism. And the truth of skepticism is the unsettled. But the falsity of skepticism is to allow yourself to become either skeptical or cynical so you become a spectator rather than a participant. There can be no democracy with just spectators. 
you've got to, be, you got to have participants, critical participants in that sense. And so one of the ways in which we try to engage in this genealogy and this diagnosis and prognosis is to say, well, when we talk about democracy, let's look at the larger background conditions and the ways in which we've reached such an impoverished moment. You don't want to just jump in the impoverished moment and say, well, it's talking about interest and what's wrong with Kansas. No, no, that's a little bit too easy. That's why we started with the tope bill. You see. And, and certainly it is the case that every democratic project, not just fragile, but is shot through with uncertainties and, 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 and no, no sureties. We do take a high risk that there could be a right-wing backlash. You do take a high risk that the right-wing politicians can engage in high-energy politics and generate some very deleterious consequences if they win. But we have a certain Pascalian wager, we make a Pascalian wager on the capacity of ordinary people that if we have a robust public sphere, they'll be able not just to pursue their interests, but also take seriously certain ideals and principles like the crucial role of, of, of vulnerable people, plights, and ways in which we can address those. And that's both moral and spiritual and political, as well as organization. So just a word about each of your excellent questions. Mm -hmm. So first on the question of the, of the level of insight and magnanimity of the ordinary citizen. Uh, I can't agree with one of the premises of your formulation, uh, which is that people vote for their interests and specifically their class interests. We know from experience that the opposite is massively the case. Uh, in the 19th century, in the debates about the introduction of the universal suffrage, <coughs> both the conservatives and the progressives uh, had the view that the universal suffrage would produce an economic revolution <coughs> in a society characterized by vast inequality. How could the universalization of the vote be reconciled with the maintenance of the established economic arrangements. Now, it turned out, as we know, that they were both mistaken. The universal suffrage was introduced, and contrary to the expectations of conservatives and progressives, there was no economic revolution. And all the time, ordinary people vote against what seemed to be their material interests. It was not very long ago in the United States, just a few years ago, that there was a debate about the taxation of, of inheritance, uh, which was in the process of being whittled down to its present residual state. At that time, the two richest men in the United States led a campaign to defend the taxation of inheritance. And they took out full page advertisements in the American newspapers in this behalf. One might think that they were speaking in the material interest of the vast majority of Americans. They were defeated in this campaign. And they were defeated according to all the empirical investigations with the support of the majority of the country. So uh, all of that suggests the veracity of David Hume's remark. Men fight for their interests, but what their interests are is a matter of opinion. So uh, the, the formulation of interests takes place against a background of assumptions, mm -hmm. not just about the present state of affairs, but also and above all about the adjacent possible. What are the alternatives? And the more we expand our imagination of the alternatives, the central topic of this course, the deeper our insight into the present arrangements. What then must we believe as Democrats and experimentalists? Uh, we must believe that uh, the insight of the people depends on their political education. Mm -hmm. And their political education is, must be obtained 
chiefly through, through, through action, through engagement. Thus, the formulaic claim mm -hmm. that the answer to the defects of democracy is more democracy. Uh, democracy, as we have discussed it in this course, is, among other things, a procedure for collective discovery and for invention of the new. Uh, and uh, skill, collective as well as individual skill in this practice, can only be obtained by more practice. That's the basic answer. So we should have no illusions about the defects of our present insight, the insight of the people, the insight of the elites. Uh, what can we hope for? What we can hope for is to deepen insight into the actual by expanding the imagination of the possible. That's the character of civic education achieved through the radicalization of democracy. And that then uh, follows very directly into your second and more pointed question about the dangers of the hastening of politics. Now, the context in which that question arose in our in our debates was <clears throat> my claim that uh, a deepened democracy must be both a high temperature democracy with a higher level of engagement and a, a faster democracy. We must hasten the pace as we increase the temperature, resolving impasse quickly. Reaffirming and strengthening the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, but repudiating the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. And that we can do that through a series of <coughs> relatively modest constitutional innovations, such as, for example, early elections or comprehensive programmatic plebiscites that would transform the logic of the presidential regime. Then comes the objection, well, is this not dangerous? Uh, and in a sense, it is dangerous, uh, as all innovation is dangerous. The philosopher Whitehead said, the business of the future is to be dangerous. And, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to understand what is the benefit that we seek by courting this danger and how is it that we can mitigate the danger? Uh, we mitigate the danger by uh, developing the package of rights, of endowments, and of capabilities of the individual. So for example, the idea of social inheritance, which is an interpretation of the older conception of property-owning democracy. Everyone should have a basic package of resources, including in the future uh, a set of endowments, of material endowments, that he would inherit from society instead of just a few people inheriting from their family. The individual must feel confident and strong and protected in a haven of vital interests so that the rest of social and economic life can be thrown open to innovation. In other words, on this view, there's a dialectical relation between what we take out of the agenda of short-term politics to make people more unafraid and more capable, and what we open to politics by throwing everything up, everything else up for grabs. That's the basic idea. And at one moment in the course, I analogize that dialectical connection to the relation between the love of a parent for the child and the vitality of the child. The parent says to the child, my love gives you an unconditional place in the world. Now go out and raise a storm. And those are the two sides of this political vision. The, the, the security, the capability given in exchange for the ability to raise a storm. Now, you may still press the objection and say, but what prevents us in the end 
from perverting or abolishing these endowments and guarantees. In the end, nothing prevents us but our own wisdom and magnanimity. And the idea that we can create a perpetual motion machine, that we can tie our own hands to abolish the dangers of history, is an illusion. When we court this illusion, all that we do in practice is to allow some present form of oppression, characteristically private oppression, rather than governmental oppression, to remain entrenched. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, nothing in these proposals, and I think here I would speak for Cornell as well as for me, is a definitive guarantee against the dangers of history. The storm is the storm. We want to go into the storm with some protection. And the greatest protection is capability. But we shouldn't have the illusion that we can abolish the storm. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is tied to a, a more general idea about mm -hmm. humanity, about mm -hmm. human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a hopeful premise, which might also be contested. Let me state the premise in uh, unvarnished form to make it all the more contestable. Uh, the premise is that most of the evil that exists in the world results from weakness rather than from malevolence. Uh, and uh, we hope to give a better space for innovation by making humanity stronger. Everyone, the idea of the shared bigness. Uh, and that, in the end, is uh, the greatest safeguard against, against perversion. Mm. Let, you yeah, let, me push you, let me push you a little bit on that, though, brother, because um, I've been invoking Plato and other right-wing figures against we Democrats that say that we confuse the hopeful with the wishful and that democracy is a pipe dream and that you either have the experts running things or you have the demos and the populace shaped by passion and ignorance, manipulated by elites of some sort. And so one question, which really pushed both of us against the wall, which is a good place to be sometime, what are the conditions under which we would give up our democratic faith in ordinary people and allow experts to run things if it looked as if we're going off the cliff? This is part of the debate between Walter Lippmann and John Dewey in the 1920s. Lippmann, public opinion, Democrats have pipe dreams about ordinary people. Ordinary people do not have the capacity to govern themselves in any way such that they generate both order and justice simultaneously. Dewey comes back, the cure for democracy is more democracy. Of course, he gets that from Jane Addams in her 1904 book, Democracy and Social Ethics. But they're both radical Democrats. We're radical Democrats. Are there, under, are there any conditions under which you would give up your fundamental commitment to the capacity of the demos to rule and allow for experts to rule? Me? None. Mm -hmm. None so, whatsoever. So, oh, so let's, so absolutist, absolutist. No, no. I'm no, just, that I'm call just, that absolutism. That so so <laughs> let's, not, let's not just theorize. No, about let's, this. Be, let's, call let's look at experience. Let's conquer time. So, yeah, 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 so, yeah, 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 yeah. so we're the, the prompt for this course. The very first thing we discussed was uh, the failure of technocratic centrism. That's right. And the right-wing nationalism and populism that came in the wake of this technocratic centrism. We're talking about Hillary so, Clinton and Don, Donald Trump. So technocratic centrism <laughs> is the That's rule right. of experts, as, right. you, as you described it. That's right. By its very nature, incapable of envisioning and implementing structural alternatives. So right. circumstances change in the world. There's a new form of production. The traditional form of production declines. Uh, the middle of the country is hollowed out. The working class majority feels abandoned and in fact is abandoned right. Right. by this right. rule of technocratic experts. And what comes next? What comes next is 
the right-wing populism and nationalism, this liquefaction of the, of the structures. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the reality. It's, 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 not as if the, it's not as if the rule of the experts could, by waving the wand of expertise, dispose of the storms of history. It can't, right, right. because it is incapable of generating the structural alternatives that the changing historical circumstance requires. So the, the idea that somehow technocratic expertise mm. in exchange for abandoning transformative ambition provides us with a safe place is an illusion. It does not provide us with a safe place, as history repeatedly shows. Mm -hmm. and one other point, too. I do think that my conception of human beings and human nature might be a little bit more bleak than yours when you claim that it's weakness rather than malevolence. I'd have to ask you what you mean by weakness. It's more than ignorance. It's, it's more than uh, uh, lack of exposure. Because education can't be just a matter of expanding exposure. It's got to be some transformation yeah. at, at a deep level, but certainly when we think about evil, you know, fascism and male supremacy, white supremacy, the yes. rule of capital, empire, occupation, that's more than just flowing from weakness or interest. There's some proclivity toward domination that needs to be arrested and attacked yes. intensely because we got human history for the most part. Yes. Ooh, she got that precious little one. We're talking about that precious little one's future. We, we got human history moving in a direction yes. oftentimes of that yes. domination. Of yes, mm -hmm. and, what is, and, and what is the antidote to that? It is making, but it is making with, no, a, with, with a thicker conception no, of human no, nature. No, but it's making more people stronger in more ways. So it's not just betting on the benignity of the ordinary person. Ben it's, ben it's, say it's, that word again. It's not just betting on the, the benignity of the ordinary person. It's... it's, it's it's, I like that, I like that. It's, it's making the ordinary stronger. Okay. So that, okay. So that it's, it's, it's not just the, a contest of more good intentions. It's that uh, the interests, good and bad, the complications, can be so widely diffused in humanity that some will press against the others. So. You could say that the view that I've just stated is like Madisonianism, not as a constitutional arrangement, but as a social vision. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, an interpretation of my constitutional claim is that to have this Madisonianism translated in society, that is to say, checks and balances not simply among branches of government, but in the whole life of society, we can't have it in government in the form in which Madison and his contemporaries imagined it. Because that form is a form for inhibition of the transformative power of the state, which then leaves private oppression, mm -hmm. oppression among classes, mm -hmm. oppression by corporate power, right. unchallenged and unchanged. Well, I think he's going to bring you some technology, though, right? <laughs> Thank you. Given that this is also a divinity school class, I'm wondering if you could reflect some more about the role of religion in American democracy, both as a force for good and evil. And I'm thinking in particular of the situation following the election where we discovered how many conservative Christians, and I speak as a Christian, the majority of conservative Christians in this country voted for Trump, and white evangelicalism now is associated with Franklin Graham and uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., but as interestingly in the mainline churches you have figures like William Barber in the Moral Mondays in New North Carolina and Bishop Michael Curry of the Episcopal Church. We have African-American prophetic figures representing the mainline 
and white evangelicals representing the majority, can we just reflect on how religion has both helped and hindered democracy in this country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want me to go I appreciate the question. I mean, one, 81 percent of white evangelical brothers and sisters voted for the neo-fascists in the making of Donald Trump. That's roughly probably the same numbers of uh, Christians across the board in the history of the American empire who have adjusted themselves to imperial expansion, patriarchy, white supremacy, and homophobia. So generally speaking, in the institutionalized forms of religion across the board, they have been adjusted to form structures of domination. And that still leaves 19%. That's better than two prophetic or possibly prophetic elements within the lived experiences of our citizens who understand the world through religious narratives. And that takes us back to the abolitionists. It takes us back to Ida B. Wells and Martin King and Abraham Joshua Heschel and so forth and so on. Malcolm X, prophetic Islamic brother. Uh, so you, 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 you're always wrestling with a small slice of religious citizens who oftentimes find themselves over against the institutionalized forms of religion that they themselves adhere to. And so in that sense, it's no surprise. I think it's a deep disappointment, it's no surprise. But it does reveal the degree to which the, the, the deep hypocrisy of our fellow right-wing evangelical folk who talk about morality and ethics and integrity, and yet they see a Donald Trump and still go in his direction. It just shows, oh, there's no real there there. Something else is operating here, you see. Uh, now, it could be an issue of abortion, or he's changing on abortion. Abortion is a very serious moral issue. We have debates over it and so forth. Uh, uh, it could be the issue of, uh, but in some ways, that's probably the major issue other than same-sex marriage that, that uh, oftentimes serves as the moral discourse of right-wing Christians up until recently. The shift taking place now. Issues of poverty, especially in various parts of the world, moving in, but for so long, those were the two issues. When you talked about ethics, that was it. So if a politician was on that side or supporting those particular issues in the way in which they understand them, they would support them. Uh, so I, I think it, it's very important not to uh, ascribe magical powers to religious forces. They oftentimes are very dangerous. Look at Turkey right now. The manipulation of religious forces to reinforce patriarchy, ways in which you constitute old style imperial mentalities to make it difficult to come to terms with what's going on with the working classes in Turkey with Kurds and, and so forth and so on. And this, we, we look at our own country the same, the same way. Does that begin to get at uh, what you, you were asking or did you want a little more? Okay. Is, is, there, is there a religious analysis of democracy that can help us, or are we having a, a secular analysis in which religious categories then get, get, uh, get fit in? Oh, no, I think throughout the course, I've been giving my own distinctive prophetic Christian analysis. I wouldn't call it religious because I, I, don't, I don't believe in religion in the abstract, you know what I mean? I'm not a religious person, I'm a Jesus-loving free black man. That's, that's different, you see what I mean? The very category, religio, as you know, binding, rebinding, it comes from the Roman Empire, it comes from the Latin that was subsumed under the Roman Empire. So, so Jesus was not a religious man, he was a particular Jew who believed in the prophetic forces coming out of Judaism. Religion becomes a certain category. And then in the 19th century, of course, everybody's got to be religious based on liberal Protestant models of what it is to have a religion. No, it's a way of life, it's a mode of being in the world. That's not a religion. Now, it's hard to think these ways because when we talk about religion, everybody just assumes everybody's got a religion. It's always been around. No, it's a historical construct. Uh, and, and, and so in that sense, I've, I, I certainly have a deeply 
Christian understanding. That's what I mean by a more bleak conception of human nature in terms of human proclivity toward greed and envy and resentment and, and domination and oppression. And how do you arrest, disrupt, interrupt that orientation? In human history in terms of structures and institutions in biographical time to invoke Brother Roberto's wonderful language in terms of our individual lives and particular persons of various kinds of ways of life and being that makes that are tied to certain stories and narratives that render agents like God, Jesus, Buddha, and so forth and so on have a certain analysis. And even when we say secular, I mean, my God, you know, uh, secular folk can be dark. Kafka was secular. It's hard to find many Christians as dark as Kafka. And when he reads Kierkegaard, he says, there's only one man in the world who I read and he says what I say, a Christian named Kierkegaard. That's what Kafka said, a secular Jew. Both of them, very dark, very bleak. Kafka, socialist. Kierkegaard, right wing. Great figure, politically disappointing. I mean, for me. <laughs> But he's my brother, because I, I, it's hard to conceive myself without checking guard, but so, I don't want to go on. So let me make two remarks. So first, uh, the first is a remark about the relation between religion and politics mm. in the United States. There's something very strange about this relation in, in the following way. Uh, most Americans profess some form of religious belief although a large part of the country seems to be in the situation of half-belief, the sentimental will to believe, and uh, ambivalent or uncertain about their religious convictions. Nevertheless, their uh, public ideas, their ideas about the country, are powerfully influenced by these religious beliefs or half-beliefs. There is, however, uh, in the United States, an inhibition against the religious criticism of religion. So the prevailing attitude seems to be that religion is a matter of the private conscience. It's somehow not appropriate to criticize the religious beliefs of other people in the name of religion. So on the one hand, there's this powerful influence of religion. On the other hand, there's a taboo mm -hmm. against the contest, the public contest of religious belief. I think this is a disaster for American democracy. It's, it's uh, entirely right and, and inevitable that uh, people's public ideas should be formed on the anvil of their religious faith, mm -hmm. however confused or oscillating it may be. But then these ideas have to be subject to contest, and not just political contest, but religious contest. That should be part of the life of a, of a rich democracy. So for example, the view uh, of Christianity that is professed by many can be attacked and should be attacked publicly as a perversion of Christianity uh, in two main respects that we have discussed in this course to some extent. Uh, on the one hand, that it is tainted by an idolatry of the institutional structure, which is unacceptable to a Christian. Any particular set of institutional arrangements is just an idol, mm -hmm. and every idol has to be smashed. That's right. uh, and it can't be given an absolute value. On the other hand, it is tainted by an exaggeration of the power of the individual to save himself or to establish, regardless of his relation to the others, a direct connection to God. What could be more unchristian than that? Uh, the, the, the Redeemer says, don't approach me before you've settled with your neighbor. With the other, where are the others? So that's, that's, a, that's a discourse about the content of the religion, which should exist in the United States. Mm. 
not just in the resources of intimacy, but on the public stage uh, as, a, as an amplification of the political debates of the country. Uh, now, that then brings me to my second remark, which is then taking this position that there should be no watertight boundary, no closed frontier between the contests of politics and the contests of religion, uh, we can ask ourselves, uh, what lies at the center of the message of these Semitic monotheisms, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam? Uh, there are uh, here two great themes that are of immense interest to the future of democracy and that heighten or reveal the connection between democracy and these, and these religious faiths. Uh, one side of uh, existence of the uh, affirmation of personality is our relation to the others. We, we, we develop by connecting to the others. Mm -hmm. But every connection threatens us with depersonalization or subjugation. How do we become free? We become free by achieving a form of connection with the others that diminishes the price of subjugation or depersonalization. Our highest experience of that is love. And love lies at the center of Christianity. But uh, love cannot command the wider sphere of social life. So we think that cooperative action among free and equal individuals is the public counterpart to love outside the sphere of intimacy. Then the second aspect of this idea of self-construction is we say, well, we can only live, we can only develop life by engaging in a particular world. But in engaging it, it, we can't surrender to it. We have to discover a way to engage in it without surrendering to it, so that we can be insiders and outsiders at the same time. We are commanded to be in the world without being of it. And therefore, as well, we need to create structures, institutions, that make it more possible for us to engage without surrender. So the, the religious faith has, has a message about our relation to the others and our relation to the structures of society that is capable of informing and inspiring our political projects. Uh, and none of this should be uh, under a rule of silence. We should be able to speak about this and speak about this in the public world. And when we speak about it, be contested. Uh, so this is a whole other avenue of the energizing of American democracy. Do not confuse the separation of church and state with the false and unacceptable idea of a closed boundary between religion and politics. Mm. But certainly you would agree that in personal love, there is a strong element of surrender that is not synonymous with submission. Uh, and if democracy is an analog to love in the interpersonal and interpersonal sphere, then there might be species of surrender that are still forms of engagement. And what I mean by that, the Christian notion of kenosis, and this is what I meant the last two weeks when I talked about John Coltrane and the Coltranian conception of being in the world in which you are giving of yourself, you're emptying yourself just like when you are in love, which is a yes. form of surrender, but that surrender engages you and elevates and edifies the best of you with all of the vulnerability, the risk, and the danger that go with falling in love personally or falling yes. in love with the demos yes. to be empowered and yes. to be empowered in a movement where you might get crushed, but you still got a smile on your face. Just like Sappho says, what's waiting for you in your personal relationship might be bittersweet, but you still got a smile on your face because the transformation that you've undergone and learning how to die in order to be reborn, to be elevated in your maturity 
is a requirement, and that learning how to die is a certain kind of surrender. So you, you, you would agree with that formulation? Uh, yes and no. Okay, so, 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 let me, so, so, so let me just add something, sure, which, I'm sure. not, which I don't think you would disagree with, Cornell. Oh, so okay. so in, in, in the world history of philosophy, of mm. moral philosophy, mm. uh, on the whole, the, the commanding ideal has been an ideal of, of, of altruism. So the, the, on this view, the basic problem in the moral life is selfishness and how to contain it. And the moral ideal is an ideal of not privileging one's own interests over the interests of others and therefore being willing to sacrifice for their sake. That, to my mind, is not at the center of the Christian vision. Oh, you're right. uh, in this I vision, agree. altruism is, although uh, necessary or admirable, an inferior stage of the moral life. And the highest stage is not altruism, but love. Love is different from altruism, mm -hmm. because uh, it, it, we have a completely different experience. We say, we, we need the others. The solution to our existence lies in the others. Mm -hmm. But the others are dangerous. How can we reconcile our need for them with the danger that they present to us in these experiences of love. That's right. But now, the experience of altruism is an experience of benevolence from a distance. So we, we give to someone, we, we, we sacrifice, but from a position of moral superiority. The sacrifice may require even the, 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 the giving of our own life. But it's not morally dangerous. It doesn't place us in an intimate jeopardy. Love is different. The condition of love is to cast down our shield. It's the expectance, acceptance of a higher vulnerability. Love can be, can be rebuffed. It can be rejected. It, it can fail. Uh, and it places us, therefore, in this situation of intimate danger. That's a different conception of what is most important in the moral life. And uh, it's that moral conception that, to my mind, has a deep affinity with these ideas about democracy that we're exploring here. Absolutely. Uh, cooperative action among free and equal individuals is, as I suggested, the diluted form of love. And uh, like love, it has this characteristic that to advance, it requires a heightened vulnerability, a heightening of the level of discretion and of trust among us with all of its consequent dangers. So this is something very deep about our self-conception, which would be uh, unintelligible to the ancients, to the ancient eudaimonism to the classical uh, virtue ethics of an Aristotle, but intimately related yeah, to our yeah. ideas of social transformation and self-transformation. Once again, a, a set of ideas that lies at the intersection of politics and religion, suppressed by this taboo against the religious criticism of religion. Mm -hmm. One could argue it would be alien to most of the philosophers in classical antiquity. I think Sophocles and Aristophanes and Euripides could resonate with what we're talking about in terms of the crucial role of vulnerability and so forth. The artists as opposed to the, uh, the arguers, those of the dialectic as opposed to the, 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 the playwrights and probably some musicians if we had access to, to the music. And you see what I'm saying? Yes. I, I do yes. think you, you get it among, but there's a, a hand in the back, yes. Oh, that's what, Brother Peter. Peter. Yeah, Peter. No, we, we, we should first just give the, uh, the, the TAs a, a hand right now. Thank you. Ready. It's been a joy. Um, since we're on the topic of taboos and pushing the boundaries of your program, uh, so usually you talked about politics, we just went into religion, one taboo, let's go into another one, which is 
uh, to Professor Unger, but at West, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Sure. Um, and I don't necessarily believe this, but it's just to test the boundaries. Um, you seem to be for all of this institutional innovation, but some of the most transformative institutional innovation has been in family structure, the structures of love, feminism, gay rights, and the like. Why have you not uh, addressed, like why we seem to be stuck in a very conservative institution where you pair off with one person, you raise people alone in a house, there are, you could imagine millions of different ways that could be. You could raise people together, the kibbutzes in Israel. Um, why do you not turn your attention of institutional plasticity to these cultural questions and these uh, relational questions? That, is that question you, addressed yeah. to me or to Cornell? To, to you, to you, Professor. Oh, well, but, yeah. but you first. Well, please. I can answer <laughs> it simply. I, I have no defense. There's, there's, no, there's no reason why I, why I shouldn't. Uh, so. I, so we, I, we finally got you. I agree. <laughs> I, 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 I agree with you entirely, 100 <laughs> percent. No, I, I think the same, the same kind of standards or criteria that we'd use in terms of integrity, honesty, consent, voice as opposed to manipulated echo would be operative in whatever relationships we're talking about, you see. So that we talked about uh, uh, same-sex marriage. We talked about making sure the dignity and sanctity of trans folk in w whatever kinds of relationships that flow. If you're talking about plurality within oneself, with plurality in another self, still in relation, those same kind of standards would persist. But we would look at the plasticity in such a way that it's not plasticity for plasticity's sake, but it's plasticity under the aegis of a certain kind of I-thou relation as opposed to I-it. It can still be dominative. It can still be manipulative. He said, well, Brother West, what if one derives great pleasure out of being dominated? That's a very important question. I mean, it's another class. <laughs> but that's a very important question, right? that uh, one not only consents to being dominated, but that's one of the ways in which one is actually stirred, not just in a sexual level, but spiritually. And then they come back to, oh, you old conservatives, Christians like Brother West always want to talk about just resisting domination. There might be conditions under which it is essential in regard to one's own self-realization based on consent. We say, oh, no, no, no. Those are hard questions for a Democrat like myself. And, and that, that's where we'd have to have a robust conversation, hearing the voices of those who would opt for those particular sites and moments as a way of ensuring there's no undermining, de dishonoring, demeaning, devaluing, which is something that I think ought to hold across the board no matter what the relationships are be it in traditional marriage or non-traditional marriage or relations or whatever. So that's just the beginning of an answer to your question. But it's true that we don't have any books on the uh, syllabus dealing with the plasticity of personal interpersonal Yeah, I relations. mean, speaking for myself, it's not a taboo. It's just a failure of imagination. <laughs> well, is that because you're reluctant to experience? <laughs> 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 we got to show Anger some new sights. <laughs> you, you started all of this, Brother Peter. He started all of this. Okay. Where, where, where's the next question? Uh, yeah, there we go. Hello. Yeah, riding the tide on um, religion and politics that we were talking about previously. Uh, Professor West, you're wearing a, a beautiful kafir, and I'd wanted to ask uh, the symbolic significance of you as a leader in this nation to wear that. And I'd like to as well ask that you share insights from um, religious, philosophical, historic, and political perspectives. Thank you. Mm. No, thank you so very, very much, though, brother. I, um, 
I think from the very beginning, I just talked about my own sense of being a fallible human being who has a certain kind of calling to quest for spiritual and moral excellence. And that has to do with being in deep solidarity with people who are suffering, people who are under domination and so forth. And when my brother, I think it's this brother right here, uh, brought this back as a gift from my precious Palestinian brothers and sisters, I said, oh my God, I, I, it's a beautiful gift. And, uh, and I'll just, I wear it now everywhere. I'm gonna be on the Bill Maher show soon. I'm gonna wear it on that show. Uh, uh, because it's, 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 it's a love gift and I, I accept that love in that sense. Uh, but it's not as if it's any, um, you know, special thing. It's just a matter of witness. It's just a matter of witness, you see. That I, I, it would be the same with my Dalit brothers and sisters. It would be the same with Kashmir folk under occupation in India. It would be the same under Sub-Sahara, under Moroccan occupation. Occupation to me is just wrong, immoral, unjust, and needs to be resisted in a variety of different ways. Uh, it could be working class Jewish brothers and sisters catching hell in Tel Aviv. You got class struggles going on in Tel Aviv even as it resides under a very ugly occupation. And so I accept gifts from a variety of different human beings who are willing to, uh, to reach out to me in that sense. But certainly it's the case in the United States where it's very difficult to have the kind of robust public conversation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So you have to cut against the grain and be willing to pay a certain kind of cost as that dialogue expands. I mean, I was blessed to be part of a demonstration with uh, my precious progressive young Jewish brothers and sisters against APEC just a few weeks ago. If not now, with Brother David May and, and a host of others, where you got, they were oftentimes, were, they were protesting against their own parents, their own grandparents because they have a sense of moral conscience. And they said, look, Palestinian brothers and sisters are not just our fellow human beings, we're in solidarity with them because their babies have exactly the same value as our Jewish babies. And that's a human choice the Jews and non-Jews can, can make. More and more young Jewish folk making that kind of moral and spiritual choice. That's very, very important, very, very important. And for me, coming out of a, a history of a people who've been so hated and traumatized and terrorized and what have you. It's a matter of trying to be the best of that tradition that has shaped me as an internationalist, as an internationalist, not just obsessed with dynamics in the US empire, but the ways in which we try to make connections with people all around the world, peasants in Mexico, working people in Argentina, on and on, women dealing with patriarchy in Africa and other parts of, of the world. So that's very much what is reflected in my, uh, my way. I know it might be kind of tight. You wonder how I'm breathing sometimes. But I have to make it tight so these people can see my tie a little bit. Thank you so much for, uh, first of all, a wonderful class this semester. I'm really sad that today is the, the last day. Um, I had a, a question on this, the United Airlines incident. It's really been bothering me. And one is, you know, talk about injustice and morality, so I have a kind of a two-part question, one to Professor Unger. Um, you know, there's been a lot of blame on, on the airline uh, for what happened, but to me this was a case of um, a corporation using the police to commit violence on a paying customer, and as the and and you know as corporations are getting bigger, um, they're they, they're becoming bigger than countries. They they're becoming very powerful, as we all know. And one is this was an abuse of obviously police power, but one is also abuse of a corporation. How do we manage as these corporations are getting larger and larger, uh, going forward to to citizens? How do we manage their relationship with government? Um, and the other part of this question is um, to Brother West, which is, um, you know, as the uh, abuse started with the customer, what, what, what shocked me at the injustice was that there were 100 citizens that watched, mm -hmm. that did not act. Are we in a society now of, of voyeurism where acting is now <coughs> videotaping and posting on Facebook, 
or is acting stepping up and actually doing something about the situation? I mean, everyone was at fault. The, the airline workers didn't step in. Uh, passengers sat there, screamed. The, you know, no, no one acted at all. And what does that really reflect in our society as we're today? As we see injustices and we talk about them, we write about them, we, we socialize Facebook, but we, but we don't act anymore. Thank you. Do you want to? Well, ju ju on the question of the corporation and of, and of corporate power, it is related directly to one of the central programmatic themes in the course, which uh, we have explored under the label of democratizing the market, renovating the institutional form of the market economy. So one of the dimensions of that renovation has to do with the way in which we can have more decentralization of economic initiative, of access to productive resources, but at the same time, more economies of scale. Now, what's the basic pretext for the existence of vast corporations? The pretext is that that's the only way to achieve economies of scale, to, ach to aggregate resources, physical, financial, and human, at a large scale. Uh, but that idea that we need vast corporations to aggregate resources is entirely dependent on the premise of the conventional regimes of property and contract. We can develop ways to fragment property rights, to have temporary or conditional property rights that would allow different tiers of right holders uh, workers, local communities, and local governments, as well as investors, to hold simultaneously claims on the same productive resources. And then we could have more decentralization and more aggregation at the same time. And we would no longer need the large corporation as the sole device for the aggregation of resources. So that's one side of the problem. But the other side of the problem is that until we do that, then the, the, the corporation exercises a power that is delegated from the state. Mm. And that's not just a metaphor. That's a matter of technical legal doctrine. The corporation operates under a governmental license. It, it operates under a legal form, a facility created by the state. That facility should be conditional. It should not be an invitation to the exercise of private oppression, as in the example that you cited. So then we would have to advance simultaneously on two tracks. The long-term track is the renovation of the institutional and legal vocabulary of the market economy so that we cease to need the mega corporation as the sole device for aggregation of resources. And the short term track is to prevent the corporation from acting as if it were the delegate of state power without facing the accountability or the constraints to which all state power is subject. Uh, so I don't see these two tracks as contradictory. I, I see them as the short-term and long-term paths toward the same goal. The goal being the creation of a democratized market economy. And one of the immediate prompts for development in that direction is the question that we have repeatedly examined here of how we can establish an inclusive vanguardism. There is a new form of production emerging in the United States and in all the advanced economies of the world, knowledge intensive production. It has the potential to revolutionize economic life. It is, however, now confined to insular vanguards. 
And because it is confined to insular vanguards, it fails to ignite accelerated economic growth. Some of the most influential economists in the United States try to naturalize the economic stagnation. But in fact, there's nothing natural about it. It's very largely a consequence of this confinement of the advanced practice of production to, to the insular vanguards. If we could escape this insularity by innovating in the institutional and legal forms of the market economy, we would find a way simultaneously to accelerate economic growth and to diminish economic inequality, to diminish it in the most powerful form, not by diminishing it simply after the fact through compensatory redistribution by taxation and social entitlements, but to diminish it by changing the arrangements that shape the primary distribution of economic advance. First, I just want to congratulate you on your op-ed piece in USA Today, talking about the ugly attacks on uh, in Indian Muslim people there in Kansas. And I want to thank your mother for that heartfelt gift of food. Uh, first point about Brother Roberto highlighting democratizing the market, there's a, there's, a, there's a relative lack of institutional capacity in American culture that raises these kinds of issues with real power and potency. And that's precisely why Nick Brown and a host of others are talking about a people's party and breaking from the Democratic Party and trying to convince Bernie Sanders and a whole host of others to come together uh, to highlight not just a critique of Wall Street, but the decentralizing of highly centralized power in the private sector, beginning with big banks and big corporations, so that this becomes part of a public conversation with a party behind it. As long as both parties are tied to Wall Street, tied to the oligarchs and plutocrats, it's going to be very difficult for this kind of analysis to actually take on concrete form on the ground. In regard to the complacency of our fellow citizens on that airplane, I think of the, uh, the language of the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel that said, some are guilty, all are responsible. The CEOs, staff involved in the particular act itself have to take some real guilt and have to have some culpability. But there's a responsibility of fellow citizens who sit there, owing to complacency, fear, being scared, or in some cases, just callous and indifferent. And see, that's part of the moral and spiritual renewal that has to take place. So there ought to be an immediate kind of response, blood flowing, some kind of intervention, just as human being to human being, person to person. I and thou. So when I talked about spiritual blackout the first week, I had a number of different manifestations, a number of different dimensions and layers. But that's one. That's one. Just to watch somebody undergoing that kind of suffering and remain a spectator with a voyeuristic sensibility. There's something deeply wrong with that. It's hard to create a radical democracy with that kind of complacency if not downright cowardice. So there's always a spiritual dimension to talking about what it means to be human being a democratic citizen at the same time. Got a hand right there. Thanks so much uh, for these very insightful answers. Um, I was inspired a bit around the conversation about voting against one's interest, and also uh, Dr. West's, West's mention of internationalism and, and to be mindful and sensitive to that. And so my question relates to, um, in a bit, so beyond just thinking about voting in one's interest, how do we get people to actually care about and be compassionate about the interests of others, be it domestically or on an international scale? And I wonder what are the prospects of doing so at an individual level through education and otherwise? And if that, <laughs> has a limited prospect, what can we do or what types of institutions are required so that we may yeah. promote mm. uh, greater compassion and empathy um, in others? So, so it's a very interesting question. It's a, mm. the question is the extent to which 
cooperative activity and solidarity are just moral givens that we either have or don't have, have in a greater mm -hmm. or lesser extent, or, the, or contrary, the extent to which they are susceptible to collective initiative and institutional innovation. Now, uh, a working assumption of, I think, all of our arguments here mm -hmm. is that there is no feature of our experience that is not on the line in history. In other words, mm -hmm. we can't divide the attributes of humanity, of human nature, into two categories and say, there's a category of the eternal, the immutable, and then there are the superficial things that change. There is no such distinction. Everything can change, though not suddenly or not easily. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, everything is in some deep way at risk in history, for better or for worse. And now then you raise this question specifically with respect to the issue of how innovations in the structure of society can increase our solidaristic impulse. And I would want to argue that they, they can. So now I'll give you four examples. Each of them is fragmentary, but the combined effect of these innovations is to increase the level of cooperation or solidarity in society. So first, in the organization of education, as we discussed, one of the desirable attributes of education under democracy is that it should be cooperative as well as analytical and dialectical. And it should operate by cooperation among students, among teachers, between teachers and students. So rather than, as it traditionally does, by the juxtaposition of individualism and authoritarianism in the classroom. Now, the second example, the organization of practical economic life, of production. One of the distinctions between the knowledge economy and traditional mass production is that the knowledge economy requires from its participants a higher degree of cooperation, of trust, and of discretion. It's like the difference between a traditional infantry battalion and a guerrilla operation. The guerrilla operation has to be more flexible and cooperative. It requires more discretion combined with cooperation from its participants. So if the knowledge economy ceased to be just an insular vanguard, and was disseminated throughout much of the economy, there would be a huge prompt in practical economic life to the enhancement of cooperative action married to discretionary initiative or innovation. Uh, the third example is in the provision of public goods uh, by the state. I argued in one of our classes what prevails in the world, not just in the United States, by way of provision of public goods, is what you could call administrative Fordism, the provision of standardized, low-quality services by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And the only mm -hmm. apparent alternative to administrative Fordism seems to be the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. But there's another option which may be, become increasingly important in the course of the 21st century, which is that in the broad middle zone between the universal minimum that the state must guarantee by way of public services and the ceiling of the most complicated and costliest services, the state can and should engage independent civil society acting cooperatively to be the partner of the state in the provision of experimental, 
ways to provide public services. That's the best way to enhance their quality. And at the same time, it provokes the self-organization of civil society outside the state. Fourth example, which in a way is the most contentious, but also the most direct response to the concern that you present. Uh, money transfers organized by the state are not an adequate basis of social solidarity. In European social democracy, they appear to be an adequate basis so long as a country, like say Sweden, was ethnically and uh, culturally homogeneous. But as the level of ethnic and cultural homogeneity diminishes, the insufficiency of money as a social cement becomes manifest. Money is not enough. It's not enough for the state to tax money from people who have it and use that money then to fund public services. That's not real social solidarity. The only adequate practical basis of social solidarity is direct responsibility to help take care of other people beyond the boundaries of one's own family beyond family selfishness. So then the principle that every able-bodied adult should in principle have at least two positions, a position in the production system, in the division of labor, and a position in what you could call the caring economy, some responsibility to help take care of other people mm. according to your own skills and capabilities. And it might mean a part of the working month or the working year, or it might mean a part of one's life, as in mandatory social services, mandatory social service as an alternative to mandatory military service. So, so my claim is that it's, it's a mistake to suppose that these intangible but immensely important moral characteristics, such as the disposition to cooperative action or solidarity are just brute facts that we can't do anything about. We can do something about them. And, and we can, through a combination of institutional initiatives, change the moral culture of democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful sentence in Brother Roberto's magisterial text on the religion of the future that says, change changes period. Radical contingency. Radical variability. And hence the need for experimentation. Hence the need for innovation. You notice in Brother Roberto's answer that he talked about example, 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 right at different levels. I think the only thing we human beings have in trying to become forces for good and make the world a better place is morally driven examples, exemplarity as opposed to market driven celebrity. Because it's through examples, and examples are not just those who have undergone a process, they are examples because they have proven in their actions, in their lives, in what cost they're willing to bear, in what burdens they're willing to, to embrace, that they're worthy of had sources that constitute for us ways of being regenerated and revived. That's why revival and renaissance and revolution become very important. And once those possibilities are cast aside, then the whole society finds itself in a rut. And there's a wonderful line in Chekhov's journal when he says the fundamental aim of life is to get out of the rut. And to get out of the rut means to shatter provincialism, parochialism, fear, being intimidated, tribalism, all the things that we are introduced to in the first stages of being human. And then to grow and to mature and to fail and to deal with the folly as well as the joy, as well as the sense 
of, and that last song was Son Hans Company, really being alive. Really being alive. Engaging in struggle, having the joy as a fruit of that struggle, engaging in visionary thinking, and dealing with the consequences, oftentimes unsettling, of that visionary thinking, and that fusion that you talk about all the time. Visionary thinking, exemplary action. And they constitute ways in which people can be changed, ways in which people can be transformed. You know, when you think of American history, we talk about the prophets, but I mean, uh, Edward Said and Susan Sontag, these aren't just names, these are people who by example constituted new ways of generating various kinds of possibilities in their writing and their actions and their or organizational affiliation, most importantly, in their witness. All of them having flaws, but all of them being really alive. We got the, we got the, we got our, we got our dear TA there. Um, based on what you said, Professor Onga, I wondered that how, in what way can you um, divorce a caring economy uh, from a society that is driven by the market? And I was, while you were talking, I was thinking about the informal economy and how people who participate or uh, who are participants in the informal economy are somewhat um, removed from access to financial instruments. And to some degree, I think they contribute to some extent in uh, the caring economy with to which you speak of. So how do you think that we can incorporate participants who engage in the informal economy? How can they have access to the financial instruments that you speak of and that would in some way incorporate them in uh, the field of inno innovation uh, which you propose? The field of? Innovation, which you uh -huh. propose. So when we speak about the caring economy, we, we may have two different things in mind. So mm -hmm. under institutionally conservative social democracy, uh, especially in the relatively egalitarian European social democracies, the form of the caring economy is administrative fordism, the provision of these relatively low quality standardized public services. The state, the government, hires people to take care of other people. They're paid. Uh, and in fact, in many of these economies, many or most of the jobs generated in recent years have been uh, in that category. Now, I was contrasting it just a moment ago to another conception of the caring economy. It's not enough for the state to hire people to take care of other people and to pay for it by some fragment of the tax tape. Everyone should be responsible for everyone else. Mm. And we should be able to organize that practically. Now, does that come in contradiction with the moral culture of the market economy? And uh, it comes into contradiction with the moral culture of the present form of the market economy. But one of the key assumptions in the economic part of these arguments is that a market economy has no single natural and necessary form. And that different forms of the market economy differ, among other ways, in their effect on these, on the moral culture of economic activity. That was the discussion that we were just having. Now, that doesn't mean that a political proposal should uh, bet on any radical and sudden transformation of human nature. If by human nature we mean simply what we are like now, what it does mean is that in choosing a direction of institutional change, 
we also always choose to develop human experience in a particular way because no institutional order is neutral among mm -hmm. uh, visions of human experience. Every mm -hmm. institutional mm -hmm. order tilts the scales. So these proposals that we were just discussing tilt the scales in favor of cooperative activity and of solidarity. And they do so for both moral and economic reasons. Would you like to? No, I think you, I think you said it. Okay, then right after we got our other yeah. teaching assistant too, but, but, but I think we should be democratic. And this is, I think, then we're going to move right to the teaching. Thank you. So, um, in keeping with the, the theme about the basis of social solidarity, in a previous lecture, which I believe was the first introduction um, that we had to this conversation, Professor Unger, you mentioned that money is not a basis of so social solidarity, as you did this afternoon. Um, and you offered the example of Europe and ethnic homogeneity and, um, and social fragmentation. Um, and when we were discussing money as not, uh, being, not being the basis of social solidarity, you offered time and not money as our most precious resource. Um, and so my question is, um, how can time be used to inspire social solidarity when we live under a political, ecological, an economic context where time is not necessarily something that we have in abundance in order to resolve some of the most prescient issues that we face today. Uh, so th th let me just say something, say something empirically, mm -hmm. because uh, we shouldn't just stay on this one topic, although it's a topic of vast interest. So let me just cite a fact. Uh, the in in the in the studies of who gives most time to charitable activity, not money, time. Here's an interesting fact. There's, there appears to be a, a strong correlation between how much time people give to charitable activity and how many children they have. Now, you might think it would have to be the opposite because the more children they have, the less time they would have. But it doesn't work that way, according to these studies. Mm -hmm. uh, the more children they have, the less time, the, the busier they are in, in family things, the more time they give to people outside the family. How could that be? So it, 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 it's, for a human being, time expands. Time is not a fixed quotient. Huh? Uh, and the, the impulse to engage has overriding importance. Now, that can't be a pretext then to say that this cooperative and solidaristic activity should just be in everyone's after time hour. That's not what I was proposing. I was proposing that we reorganize the economy so that this activity of engagement with others be part of the institutional organization of society and not simply a private avocation of private generosity. Mm. And I think this issue of time cuts a number of different ways. You've heard me say that I believe that artists are the vanguard of the species and I think musicians are the vanguard of the artists. And one of the things that artists and especially musicians do is to allow us to break free from the prison house of time by using time in such a way that in the midst of temporality, there's kairos, there's meaning infused moments within temporality that get us to think, examine, interrogate, change, transform. And that's what great art, that's what great music does. So that we don't have the, the, the pipe dream of somehow transcending time in time, but we have ways of engaging time. I, I have this discussion with my brothers in prison all the time, because they got a lot of time on their hands. And 
have to ask God, how do you use time rather than allow time to use you? Because you're going to be here a while. But you can actually undergo magnificent transformation and have moments of liberation in that time that you have to take before you leave the prison. And of course, in that sense, it goes, this holds for all of us, because we're all in the prison house of time and space, and nobody gets out alive. And if you do, let me know. <laughs> so there's this issue of, I mean, Sartre talks about this in the Critique of Dialectical Reason, this, this, the scarcity of time, and how do you use time? Well, musicians are, way, are, are artists who wrestle with time, not just in the time of preparation before they get to the moment of performance. And it's not as if just in the club, they're going for two hours. No, they've been, they've been practicing for a long time. And that time necessary to then, and the same is true with a Shakespearean play or whatever it is, these artists take a whole lot of time in order to help us arrest time in the moment of performance. And they help us engage then ordinary time, chronos, from that kairos, that meaning infused moment. And in that way, there is no cooperative activity or solidarity without that kind of critical examination as to who we are, what does it mean to be human, how are you going to spend your life, what kind of virtues and values will you enact in the short amount of time that you're here before the worms get your body. Now those are very deep, existential and political and spiritual and political uh, and, and economic and social issues. But, th but they have to be talked about simultaneously. They have to be talked about simultaneously. What it means to live a life that enacts a whole that's always bigger than the sum of the parts and to think in synecdochic terms, in terms of synecdoche, wholes as opposed to just elements and factors that are aggregated into some kind of uh, arithmetic uh, summation. The sense of being thinking in terms of wholes and, and totalities in that way. So that's another way of, of trying to to, to wrestle with this tough issue of, uh, of time. And we got a question from our sister TA. Thanks. Um, so this uh, speaks to what you've already been saying before, but this is a question that's been put forward in discussion sections by the undergrad that relates to this, so I wanted to bring it up before we move on. But um, So we've talked about uh, the New Deal as an example, um, which we might draw inspiration for thinking about new economic and political projects to foster institutional experimentation, right? And um, so the issue of the knowledge economy has come up, it was we've been talking about here. Um, but we have talked less about how to reconcile putting forward new grand political or national projects when the rise of the knowledge economy and the technological innovations that have made it possible have so dramatically changed the dimensions of sociality. Um, so in other words, how do we reimagine and recontextualize the grand projects or national visions of the past to think about the future when new media, information, communication, information and communication technologies have changed exactly our everyday experience of time space. Um, and they've enhanced a sense of e ephemerality and also enabled a fostering um, of interpersonal relationships and identities that do cut across international boundaries as we've been talking about, um, but perhaps have also made us uninterested or even antagonistic towards the kinds of modernist or monumental public works of the 20th century relating to the New Deal, for example. So, so how do you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, you, the, the question is formulated in a way that suggests you, you have more than an interest. You, you have a position. Tell us something about the position. Okay, well, this was, put, this was combined in discussion with the undergraduates. Yes, well, collective position. <laughs> so I think part of the question has to do with recon rec um, reconciling with the fact of how um, knowledge economies are coming out of the fact that the way that we socialize do has changed so much. And so yes, it's opened up possibilities for um, new kinds of solidarities, yeah. but it's also made perhaps a, a new forms of national um, projects or experiments less uninterested or, or more difficult to try and actually mobilize. I mean, this can also get back to the question. So it's interesting. So, so if, I, if, if I understand correctly, there, there are at least two dimensions here to your, to your provocation. The first, this evocation 
of the immense potential of these new technologies, especially the technologies of communication, as in social media. Uh, and the suggestion that this potential has been barely utilized. Now, if, if I'm understanding that correctly, I, I agree. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the discourse that now takes place in the United States about economic stagnation, under the label secular stagnation, as I was saying before, the economists, many of the most influential economists, attempt to naturalize the present economic stagnation. And one of the ways in which they make it seem natural is that they claim that these contemporary technologies are intrinsically less transformative than the technologies developed at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, I think it's uh, entirely mistaken, and that these technologies have a vast transformative potential, which we have only barely harnessed. And part of the reason why we have barely harnessed it is that they remain confined to a very narrow slice of economic life in, in the real world of production. So they're used for communication, as in social media, but they haven't been used for a more fundamental and encompassing transformation of economic life. Uh, so the basic idea there is that uh, the depth of a change in the practice of production is related to its scope. The more it's limited, to a series of islands, the less its potential is, is revealed and developed. Its potential is revealed and developed as it expands to, to, to take hold in a much broader range of, of forms of social life. So, so, that's, so that's one side of the provocation, right? I think it's more a matter of because these kinds of economies are already actually spread and because the way that our experiences of everyday life have changed because of them. But they haven't. But, but, but there, I, if, if, if that's the argument, then that's where I would disagree with you. So they've, the, the gadgets have been sold and are widely used as for communication. But the, the radical change in the way of doing things is actually largely confined to these relatively isolated vanguards. So one thing is to distribute the technological facilities, to sell computers or, or mobile phones. Another thing is to reorganize practical economic life to seize the dormant potential of these technologies. That's actually not happened or it's happened only in these insular vanguards. So that seems to be one side of the provocation. But, the, uh, but there's another side to your provocation, which, uh, is, which you brought out to some extent in the last part of your remarks, which is the relation between these technological innovations and the contest between nationalism and globalism. So there is a suggestion in what you said that these technologies were somehow on the side of globalism against nationalism. And it's not clear that that's true, because once again, it's an issue of what, what, what we do with them. Huh? So mm. my inter at least my position, I'm not sure I can speak for Cornell here, but, but my, my position is that it is a mistake for the leftists for the progressives in this contest between nationalism and globalism to take just the side of the globalists against the nationalists. It's more complicated than that mm -hmm. because uh, the transformation of society has to proceed simultaneously in different directions. The division of states in the world 
is a form of moral specialization within humanity. We experiment with a different direction. We need strong national projects rather than just a diluted anti-national cosmopolitanism. And uh, we, we, we want these strong national projects to be experiments in different ways of deepening democracy and democratizing the market, because there is no one way. And uh, these technologies that you draw our attention to could be a tremendous instrument in the service of these national experiments. There's no need to cast them as the device of the globalists against the nationalists. Mm -hmm. And we and the, the the kind of open world that we want is not an open world that is premised on the suppression of strong national experiments. Because then all the friends of the strong national experiments must become enemies of the open world. Openness in the world, the communication of humanity, the construction of a world order, should not have as its premise the denial, the strangulation of these strong national trajectories. So it seems to me that what, one of the many things that we've been struggling to in, this, in, in the arguments of the course is a different take on the contest between globalism and nationalism, in which we reject the form of nationalism that is presented by right-wing populism, but we don't simply then seek refuge in an anti-national globalism. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that, Cornell? Because well, that's fact, a very I, important I theme in the further, course. I don't agree with you, but I would say the same thing about localism. I would say the same thing about state level in, in the United States or the province level in other countries. I'd say the same thing about regionalism that you have to have a cosmopolitan international vision, analysis, solidarity, but it has to be rooted. And the, root, the rooting has to do with both a national project. We talked earlier in the course, you recall, about what happens when, as in the present Trump moment, the nation state dominated, colonized by oligarchs, plutocrats, xenophobes, military generals, and so on where you get a robust, robust localism in the form of resistance, very important. That doesn't trump international solidarity, uh, undocumented immigrants, Muslims, and so forth and so on. So the question is, how do we think simultaneously with these different levels, but at the same time acknowledge each one having its specificity and therefore its own kind of validity if it meets the democratic criteria? Because you can rest be assured that the, uh, the oligarchs and plutocrats have their own globalism. All you got to do is you know, read corporate media, New York Times, and other places. Thomas Friedman will tell you how flat the world is. And we'll say, given that flatness, we're going to keep track of who's next the boot is on. Because it's still hierarchical, given the flatness. And so there you've got that, you know, the dialogue between what, what Roberto is calling the left versions of dialectical interplay of internationalism, nationalism. You say the same thing about localism and so forth and so on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's very interesting that, uh, as we come to the end of this class, that uh, the great Ralph Waldo Emerson, he gave two grand lectures on American Stalin and addressed to the Harvard Divinity School students. After, after, after the last one, he was, he was banned for almost 30 years from Harvard because he was so radical, which meant he must have said something worth taking seriously. And one of the things he said was, not just that you find the extraordinary in the ordinary, and we ought to be our concern with the plot of common people, and truth is on the highway, and so forth, all of those kind of cliches we associate with Emerson, but he was saying, when will America no longer have an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Europe? When will America actually become indigenous in its ways of thinking, acting, living, given the new experiment taking place? Oliver Holmes called that the cultural declaration of independence, the analog to the Declaration of Independence 50 years earlier. Now, 180 some years later, how do we understand 
that R-O-T-E-S relation to R-O-U-T-E-S that we've talked about in this class. The various roots that are always pluralized, historicized, contextualized, and the routes that we take intellectually, politically, spiritually, and so forth, as in our own lives and as it relates to trying to make the world a better place unless the elites in place blow up the whole planet, which is a real possibility. Uh, uh, so there's a, an added urgency in that sense. But there's something to build on in terms of, uh, of Emerson as one of the grand exemplary prophetic figures of dealing with these kinds of interplays of these different levels of cosmopolitanism and localism and nationalism. Cornell, we should end a few minutes early because of the course evaluation procedures. Oh, is that and right? Yes, and, but I just wanted to say that I really like this soft way of ending without crescendos because it allows me to have the illusion that it's not ending. <laughs> Some illusions can be highly efficacious. <laughs> so, but it's been a wonderful time with you all. Thank you, you all. <laughs> Wonderful time with you all. <laughs>